Um, Om next. Uh, so uh, this talk is about Ohm, um, uh, but it's, it's actually there are much bigger ideas than Ohm. Uh, if you're not using Ohm, um, hopefully there's a lot of things you can take away. Uh, I think uh, the way that we design applications, uh, specifically how we design applications that involve clients, remote clients, mobile clients, it could get radically simpler. Uh, and so even if you don't decide to use Ohm, uh, I think there are a lot of ideas you can take away. Uh, I can't spend too much time on how Ohm works today uh, because there's just too much stuff to cover, but that's okay. Um, again, there, there, are, there are principles at play here that are much broader than Ohm specifically. Okay, so the story so far, um, it's been 16 months since Ohm was first released. Uh, there are tons of users, there's large projects. I've seen projects with like, you know, 10 to 20,000 lines of code of ClojureScript, which is a lot of ClojureScript, so it, it's, it's doing well. Um, it, you know, the, the, one of the big ideas, though, wasn't just to get people to adopt Ohm, right? That's Ohm was as, as much an idea as it was a library. Um, it was to demonstrate to sort of the Closure and ClojureScript community at large that there was a more idiomatic approach to uh, user interface development, um, that it was possible to do uh, uh, very nice uh, UI programming with functional techniques. I think this is something that's not well understood. It's definitely not covered in academia. Uh, and it was, it was nice to see that React could uh, take us there. And Ohm you know, pushed it a little bit further. But it was, it was also part of my intent was also to demonstrate to the broader uh, UI community, specifically JavaScript, um, that there's just a completely different way to do it. Uh, and, you know, this, and again, Ohm was from my own JavaScript perspective. I've been doing JavaScript UI work for a decade. So we love React. React is amazing. Uh, you know, the JavaScript world sort of con considers it as a framework. Uh, we don't really care about that part of React, but we do love it. And just because React, unlike most JavaScript-based technologies around UI development, React is immutable friendly. Um, it requires no explicit observation. Uh, explicit observation means that um, you have a resource, you have a life cycle, and you have to be involved with uh, adding and removing listeners, which is not fun if you want to be immutable. It also solves this great problem, which is it deals with browser quirks, going back to IE8, which is a big deal. Um, there's still old browsers you have to deal with. And finally, uh, React is heading in the right direction. Uh, so often you hear these people say, well, why don't you use some other virtual DOM diffing thing? Uh, and these things are, they're cool, and innovation is always important, but fundamentally, Facebook has a lot of engineering muscle. They are working on uh, making React work with uh, desirable platforms, desirable targets. And this is something that small teams cannot offer. If you've ever looked at React Native, uh, it's just um, a shit ton of Objective-C. Uh, I don't want to write that code. Okay, Ohm principles. So Ohm has some principles. This is the basic ones. It has a lot of features, but we're not gonna talk about those. We wanna stick to the core ideas. Uh, so Ohm is single store. Uh, you know, you put all your state into one place. It's very similar to the way that we think about databases. I think this has huge advantages. Um, there's an asynchronous rendering loop. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes that you see in typical UI work is that people flush too soon. You flush your operations, uh, you have some crazy event loop, there's an event cascade, and then everybody's flushing. And this is the single biggest source of performance bottlenecks. Uh, people hack in JavaScript, they add debounce all over the place. Uh, it's terrible. So Ohm forces you to think uh, in terms of an asynchronous rendering loop that goes to 60 frames a second. This is not my idea. So I, I had done quite a bit of Coco in the past, and Coco has a really nice thing called set needs display, which cues a render. Uh, you're not in control of flushing. Uh, it also supports jumping to any point in time, uh, which means that you, uh, things that are generally uh, kind of annoying to do, you have to use the command pattern if you're doing, doing this in an OO way, but O makes it very easy. You can take a, um, a snapshot of this state, which is efficient to compute because um, persistent data structures, which you heard about yesterday, uh, and Ohm can just go back in time. And again, this works because React has a nice uh, diffing-based strategy that makes this very natural. Uh, so. Things like, you know, you do an optimistic update, server says, well, that's not going to work. It's very easy to roll back, <clears throat> and so on. Uh, and there's, of course, deeper implications for rich applications. So if you're doing anything that's like a complex editor, um, doing undo or sophisticated forms of undo 
uh, and replay and redo are, are actually dramatically simpler uh, with persistent data structures. Uh, it, it, one good example is um, actually Adobe had acquired this product called Behance, and they don't use ClojureScript, but they use Mori. Uh, and they have this crazy, you know, rich UI that people can build design profiles with, and their whole undo stack is based on uh, ClojureScript data structures. But Ohm is not perfect. Very, very little software in the world is. Ohm has issues. And you know, over time, uh, it becomes clearer what those issues are. Um, you know, one of the biggest things, if you've, if you've done Ohm, and eventually you sort of just train yourself around this problem, is that, is that Ohm mistakenly, I think, uh, tried to, um, at the bottom, when you make your components, it has a sort of, you use functions. Um, but the problem is uh, you have closures. And actually, React's lifecycle is uh, problematic. Uh, because you don't know when those methods are going to run, and you don't know what data you actually closed over. And so this is something that's going to go away. Uh, cursors. Cursors bought us a lot of time. It bought us 16 months of time. It was the best idea that I had 16 months ago. And in fact, it, it was an OK idea. It's been sort of ad adopted in many places. Um, it you know, gives, you this sort of, um, uh, gives you sort of the benefits that you get from zippers or lenses, but the API is, is around um, collection access, right? So you have this very natural, uh, I'm going to get a key, or I'm going to access an index, uh, and you get a thing which tracks the location. Uh, but as really, it turns out that it really it was a stopgap. It was just a way to, so that we could build modular programs. But it's not like I thought they were the best idea. It just let us get to where we were going to go. Uh, and then there's another problem, which is that Ohm fundamentally, you know, I, I, you know, I released it, and they had a very small set of things that I wanted to prove to the larger UI programming community, which means that there are a lot of things where it was not clear um, whether this should, should or should not be pluggable. Uh, and I think it's you know, clear to me now that it's not quite pluggable enough. And then there's missing pieces. There are things that we just, that, that just never got addressed uh, because no ideas. I had zero ideas. Uh, this talk is very much about just stealing good ideas. Um, and we'll talk about that more. But there's missing pieces. So seamless sync. So something, you know, right when it released, people were like, how do you do sync? And I was like, ah, I don't know. I have no idea how to do sync. Um, and sync, sync has uh, multiple dimensions. Uh, the first thing you're always wondering is like, well, how do I get the initial set of data from the server? Uh, and once you get the initial set, then you have this other problem, which is how do I get changes, the change set? Um, some, some amount of time passes. You need to update the client because something happened on the server. You know, how do you merge those into the um, client application state. So there's just no solution. Uh, people have ad hoc solutions, because you know, they, they can work around this problem, but there's no standard way uh, to talk about this problem. So one thing I've learned from Rich Hickey is the very first thing you have to do uh, is describe the problem. And the problem has nothing to do with Ohm. It has nothing to do with React. There's a generic problem for all software that has to uh, deal with remote clients. You have a server, and you have some remote client. Um, and then. Once you describe the problem and it's clear uh, what the problem is, you have to enumerate solutions. And that doesn't mean your one idea. Right? One idea is not enough. Uh, you have to weigh it against multiple solutions. And we're going to talk about three that I think are, are really important. Uh, and not, none of them are anything that I came up with myself. One is from Facebook, one is from Netflix, uh, and the other is Datomic and from Cognitech. OK. So what's, what's the actual problem? So Tim Berners-Lee, when he inv invented the first web browser, um, you notice there's this beautiful, rich UI, which eventually became OS X around this. Tim Berners-Lee wasn't writing something that was for generic UI programming. We already had well-understood tools um, from Smalltalk on Smalltalk-influenced systems for building uh, UIs. The web browser was just a way to make documents, to link documents together. There was no intention for it to be any sort of sophisticated um, UI system. And the problem is, now that we live in the age of the internet, and we have Android apps, and iOS apps, and mobile apps that are on the web, it doesn't work, right? The, the browser fundamentally was never designed for this problem, and people have added layers which uh, address some dimension of the problem. Uh, but the issue is that the apps that you're building are increasingly becoming less like documents and more like uh, traditional applications. And traditional applications have very complex state, they have very complex events, and it's a very complex tree of real UI components. It's not a document. Right? It's, it's very much a graph of UI components. Uh, so so you, you eventually, you, 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 will, you will see that what's happening is that you know, a, a good idea for the web, which is REST, uh, 
people tried to co-opt it for solving the rich um, client problem. Uh, and it ends up being a horrible, terrible fit. Uh, and people have these really convoluted, you know, monstrosities that are back-end services. This is an image from um, uh, Miyazaki's um, Howl's Moving Castle. Uh, so, you, you know, in REST, you're supposed to have a logical, end, logical resource, and you separate them, and they're all supposed to be separate. But the client never needs one resource. Uh, and in fact, with mobile clients, the problem is quite large. You cannot incur the latency of going back uh, over the network because bandwidth sucks on mobile. Uh, and what happens is that people start folding in more and more resources into this endpoint. You have a service that just looks terrible. It doesn't actually solve everybody's problems. And in fact, you make decisions that don't work for future clients. You know, Apple releases a watch. Now, now what? You know, how are we going to serve that? Um, and this is only going to continue to get worse. Uh, I think if you've been in this space and you've had to serve iPads and iPhones, Android tablets, and so on, uh, you know that um, it, 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 creates, it creates problems when you try to you know, basically sort of force REST into um, serving all these different clients. There's, a, there's an alternative. Uh, and there's a demand-driven approach. I can't get into every aspect of demand-driven design. Um, I actually did a talk at QCon. I have no idea when that will get released. But if you want to hear more about that, uh, which I can only dig into a little bit today, uh, check out that talk. Uh, but effectively, uh, in these solutions that I'm going to, uh, possible potential solutions that I'm going to talk about today, um, there are important properties that must be maintained in order to get um, the value proposition that I'm talking about. Uh, any system that's going to fix this problem that you have today needs to have some way to basically um, allow clients to have composable demands. So you, the, the client gets to describe the demand, but every unit of the demand must itself fully function as something that can be sent uh, to something that can fulfill that demand. It has to compose. It has to be recursive. Uh, and you'll see that when I'm saying this this, 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 this property exists outside of Clojure. The two other systems I'm going to talk about are JavaScript systems, and they have this property. They are composable. And every, basically, sub-demand is itself a, a full demand. Uh, there's another huge issue, which is um, all, all these systems support interpretation. Uh, they don't, they don't hard-code what the demand means, and this is extremely, extremely important. Uh, in, in fact, uh, the reason it's so important is because you, when you write the UI, uh, a huge source of complexity is where's my data? Where is it? If you were here for David Chlimsky's talk, uh, you really, it's really nice when you don't have to care about whether the data is in locally in a cache or if it's remote. And in fact, your UI should not be involved in that problem at all. Uh, and the solutions I talk about uh, allow the component to declarative, declaratively describe what it needs but it's not involved in where I'm going to get it. That's something, something else to do this. So um, it's really important. You have a phrase, a generic phrase. That's a nice one. And it's great when you can understand in this context it means uh, something completely different. This is actually a great slide from a great talk by um, uh, Gregor Cazales. Uh, I, forget, I mean, I actually forget what it's called. But go to his website. It's like one of his uh, most recent talks. Uh, Gregor Cazales did um, the art of the um, meta object protocol. OK. So what's the first solution? Uh, one, one potential awesome idea. So Facebook and, uh, had their big conference in February, and they announced this thing called Relay and GraphQL. Uh, a lot of people thought the GraphQL thing was new. It's not new. GraphQL has long been in use at Facebook. Uh, it's, it's something that the PHP engineers use when they want to run queries. They're building a social network. It's much more natural to write queries um, that are these composable graph fragments. So they were forced into this solution because of the nature of the software they were building. Um, Relay's innovation is to expose the GraphQL syntax to clients. So GraphQL was long in play. It was, it was already there. They're just simply moving it into the client. Uh, and Relay's innovation, the awesome idea that we're going to steal, is that in Relay, components are annotated with, a comp uh, with these composable query fragments. So again, this idea of comp compositional fragments, you can compose them because they're all the same. They all look the same. Uh, this is a Relay idea. Uh, and Relay has, has all these features, and we can't get into every last possible thing. In fact, this talk is mostly about high-level features. You know, there's lots of details to fill in. Uh, and I won't talk about them, but hopefully this kickstarts a lot of discussions, and people can, can think through the details. Uh, Jason Graf Falcor, this is a Netflix thing, uh, developed completely independently. 
a Facebook. It has no relation, right? So Facebook, Facebook, gets, Facebook has, has a monolithic design. Even though, even though Facebook is massive, right, their, their fundamental design architecture is that of the monolithic application. Uh, those of you that follow Netflix know that Netflix does not have this design. Yet they ended up in the same place. They do not have a monolithic application architecture, but they ended up with the same idea. It's you know different library, you know different syntax, but it's the same idea. Uh, Netflix uh, had a REST-based system. They had a REST-based system. They worked on it for two years. It was a turd, right? It was horrible. All the problems I talked about, they 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 encountered. They removed it. They switched to Falcor. They just erased 90% of their code. Right? You can see. Uh, Jafar Hussein has spoken three times about JSON Graph and Falcor. Um, yeah, 90% of the networking code disappears. And you'll see in, the, in my demo that clearly this is not, it's, I mean, it's a reproducible thing. JSON Graph is a simple data oriented API. Uh, I talked to Jafar, and Jafar said, you know, I was like, how did you get the JSON Graph Falcor idea? It was like, well, I, I watched all these awesome Rich Hickey talks, and I said, what would it look like if I only, if I designed my API around data, right? Uh, and that's, that's, that's what JSON Graph and Falcor is. It's just a data-oriented design that was inspired by um, Rich Hickey's talks, uh, Simple Made Easy, and so on. Uh, Falcor is the routering component, and this is another idea we're just going to steal. Falcor takes uh, the simple JSON data structure which describes what the client wants. It's just a recursive data structure with keys. And what Netflix does is they take each key, and Falcor is a router. It recursively fans out on, on the values, and each value is another map with more keys. It collects all the results, and it returns something in the exact same shape. The shape of the, of the thing that's returned to the client is precisely the shape of the thing uh, the client requested. And the, requiant, the, the client only gets what they want. They don't get anything more. Well, this, is, this is actually identical to uh, GraphQL. Uh, the components get to describe exactly what they want. It's recursive, and they get back the result in the exact same shape um, that they made their demand in. Uh, there's another, there's a third possible uh, idea and solution, and that's the atomic pool syntax. So if you're here for David Chalimsky's awesome talk about the atomic, um, this is a bit of a review. It's not nothing, nothing new. Uh, the atomic pool syntax does this, right? It lets you, without having to write, think about, think about what he was showing. He was showing, oh, you could touch the entity and you could write a bunch of code, or you could just use the pool syntax. No code, right? No, no chance for bugs. The pull syntax just describes in a declarative way what you, what you would have had to write functional code for. Right? You can just get rid of that code. Uh, a datomic pull syntax, pull syntax is fundamentally just recursive select keys. So if you're familiar with select keys from Clojure, select keys is a vector of keys. Uh, datomic simply makes that thing a recursive operation. It's just recursive select keys. It's not scary. Recursive select keys, that's all it is. It's just a generic, simple data description GraphQL, it's a, it's a, I mean, this is one thing I don't like about GraphQL, and we're not going to take this. GraphQL is a string-based syntax. It requires um, uh, a pass. They convert it to an AST. It's, it's too much. So we're just going to use simple data. The atomic pool syntax is simple data. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, again, this is just a review. You have a vector. Uh, you want to get the person's first name. You want to get the person's last name. You want to get the address. So the address actually is a join. The address is not. Uh, the address is some reference to something else. In Datomic, you would say is component, and this pull syntax would actually pull in all the uh, aspects of the um, address entities that are associated with this person. If I want to, for example, only get the zip code, then I take the key, I wrap it in a map, and I supply a new vector, and I say what thing I want. But again, this has this property. It's recursive. It's simple. The whole thing looks the same all the way down, right? So immediately you should, you should think, this can be composed. I can actually distribute fragments throughout my program, and I can build up some larger uh, query. So let's synthesize these ideas into, into something. So this is, this is basically what Omnex is going to look like. Um, you know, the details are probably going to change. I mean, Omnex is by no means ready. Uh, but there is a working thing, and I'm going to demo the working thing. And I think it will demonstrate the power of the ideas behind Relay, GraphQL, Datomic Pool Syntax, uh, JSON Graph, and Falcor. So this is one possible, one possible future for Ohm. Uh, this is a, a small snippet of code, and let's focus on just a few things. 
The first thing is contactless. Contactless no longer takes any arguments, zero arguments. It does not take props, does not take ops, doesn't take anything. Uh, this, this basically gets us out of this problem where you could close over something and then in a life cycle not have closed over the thing that you thought you closed over. So you can't, it just doesn't take arguments. There's a standard interface. This thing receive, will, will receive the same arguments that it received before, but you can never close over things accidentally. Uh, the next thing to notice is this, right? There is a static method, and this is really important. It's a static method. It's a method you can invoke without instantiating, without rendering anything, and it's just um, pull syntax, right? So here it says this component needs its co contacts, but it doesn't actually know how to get those contacts. It doesn't, it act, in fact, doesn't care, because we need to preserve modularity. The same modularity that cursors gave us in the past. So you, we have a little question mark contact. It says, well, somebody knows what I need from app contacts. I don't know. Then we say, well, we're going to bind that to some other component, possibly written by some other person. We just don't care who that person is. I and mean, we have to know what we're going to render. We're going to render a contact. But we're not concerned about what that thing actually needs. We ask it. Tell us what you're, what you're going to need. I'm going to compose your query uh, with mine. Uh, and then finally, is a small change down here, which is, um, uh, so while it was, it was nice to have protocols in, in Ohm, it, to me, it, it ended up being more work um, than it really was really worth, because uh, it introduced a lot of indirection. Ohm components, are, it's going to be like quiescent. Uh, you might not be familiar with that, but quiescent is a very thin wrapper. So this whole expression that I've written, it just generates a JavaScript class. And you'll just have these, that render method is the exact same render method you would have written, you know, say, if you'd done this in JavaScript. It's just normal JavaScript class. That's what this generates. Uh, so removing a lot of the indirection that we had before, uh, so we, which will make debugging uh, own programs simpler because there's a lot less stuff to crawl through on your stack traces. Uh, okay, so give each component, this is the big idea, idea. give each component a datomic syntax uh, Datomic pull syntax fragment, just stolen from Relay, right? I just took that idea, stole it, I tweaked it a bit to make it a little bit more relevant for closure programmers. Uh, cursors disappear, and we'll dig into what that means. Um, and then we can supply an optional server uh, side router. Uh, so we could add middleware, whether that's pedestal or ring, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and this is completely optional. Uh, if you decide that you don't want to have some server side component, you don't, you don't need it. Uh, but that's the beauty of the Falcor thing, right? Falcor fu fundamentally does not need a back-end thing. This is actually a bit antithetical to um, Relay. Relay, they want, they want to do this thing, and I think it's probably unwise um, in that you can't use it without some other thing. Uh, so Ohm is not going to make these decisions. We're going to be quite a bit more conservative. But if you do supply a router, you will have a more powerful system. It's a system that can do sync for you. So no cursors. People, I've said this, and like, there are no cursors. What does this mean? Why, don't, why, 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 why do cursors disappear? Uh, cursors, only, all, the only reason to have them is they delivered dependency tracking. That was the only reason they existed. They're, they're, that's, that's it. Um, once you add queries to your components, once the, the component specifies what it needs, uh, you can build an index on the fly, right? Even, even at runtime, you can actually say, I know the exact data dependency path this component has, because the query just tells you. There's, there's, no, there's no other information. The query describes exactly what the component needs, you don't need cursors. And this is actually beautiful, because now it means that your, your components just take values. There's no this weird magical cursor thing. It's gone. Uh, and again, again, query fragments, because they're associated with components, building an index of what components need, it's, it's really trivial. I wrote, like, I don't know, 10 lines of code to make this work. Other changes, uh, components can be used without a render loop. This is like quiescent. I don't recommend it, but you know, for whatever reason, if you want to use it without a render loop, you can. Uh, integrating custom stores is much simpler. So the very first thing I did was like, okay, this is awesome. I don't need cursors. And how hard would it be to integrate DataScript? And like, it took me like, you know, I wrote 50 lines of code. And now I can use DataScript as a backing store. So the store part, how do you, what shape is your data? It no longer has to be a tree. It can be a tree, but it can be DataScript, or it can be something remote, like Datomic. It's, it stops mattering what your store looks like, uh, which is huge, because I can't predict what you want to do, and now you have the freedom to decide this is the type of local cache or uh, remote uh, storage that my application has. Uh, one, one thing that's really awesome, though, if you use Datomic, and Datomic has this huge advantage, and it can run these 
uh, effectively graph queries for you. So you can, uh, basically, you can interpret these keys and say, well, I know that this key, this part, is actually something I can run directly against Datomic. Uh, there's no reason to, to write any code. Datomic will just do what you want. And this is huge. It's awesome. Uh, it also, there's a, a huge benefit to things that look like Datomic, or if you can simulate what Datomic does, huge. Because Datomic has a notion of entities, and there's a very natural association with an entity and a component. Uh, that means that, for example, you have some grid view or some UI widget, and you know you need updates from the server. Well, Datomic has a whole sense of time. I can say, well, I'm at T50, and now we're at T100, and I can say, Datomic, I, this is the entity that I'm interested in. Give me the, all the changed datums, right? And it can just send you all this stuff. And again, this is like a, a one-liner uh, with Datomic. OK, enough talk. Let's see a demo. All right, so here is um, what it looks like at the moment. Uh, so Ohm Next is not going to replace Ohm because, again, there's these huge, huge applications. So I'm very much interested in not breaking anything that exists and having there's going to be a migration path. Uh, but so I can include the Ohm Next uh, namespace up here. And it, it, looks, it looks very similar. If you've done any Ohm, it, there's nothing, there's very little new to see. Uh, what's really cool, though, is that here I have this, I, I'm going to test getting a query. So I have this contact list, and it has this uh, pull syntax fragment. And then I have contact. And if I scroll up, uh, contact has its own fragment. And then we have this address, which is commented out, which we're going to add later. And the address info view has its fragment. So let's see. So I go, whoops. Oh, no. Turn that off. Start over. Let's try this again. Sorry. Um, we wait for that. Sorry, this is going to be somewhat slow because this is a really old laptop. So apologies for it not being super fast. Uh, but no. So while, while we're waiting for this, note that in the body of the thing, um, render looks. Render doesn't look different, right? So render, so it's amazing. So the render part of Ohm stays exactly the same. The only thing that's changing is that uh, we now have this declarative thing for uh, grabbing the bits of information. So let's compile this again. Okay, switch the namespace. Boom. There it is. So I said, give me your query. And actually, this is amazing for debuggability. You now have components where you can always know exactly what the, the component wants. So down here, I have a little bit of core async. I'm going to say, this is without doing anything with the UI. So with the, I have not instantiated the UI. I'm calling a static method. It requires no instantiation of the actual component. I can say, get the query for the contact list, uh, fetch it, hit the endpoint, and then give me that data. Right? So my request looked like this, right? and then down here, I got only what I requested. So let's, with again, I'm not going to update the UI yet. I'm going to scroll up here. I'm going to now include uh, this part, right? So we want the first person, la the, the first name, last name, the telephone number. Now we want the address. And then if I run this again, we see that the query, it composed. Right? This is another, le another level. I've asked another component for, for a piece of the, of the data. Boom. I didn't have to change anything. I had to go to the server. Right? I had to change nothing in the server. I didn't have to change the endpoint. There's just one endpoint that understands how to serve whatever the client wants. There's no, there's no more coordination between what did the backend person want to specify and what does the client need. So having done REST-based systems for a decade, there's this ridiculous long cycle where it's like, OK, the endpoint doesn't have what I want. In this world, the, basically, the front end people get to describe what they need. And the back end doesn't get to do this, right? There's some, there's some work they have to do around security, authentication, the usual stuff. But the clients are now in control of the data they need. Oh, and actually, so let's, uh, let's, let's actually add this to the front end. You know, so if you're doing FigWheel or whatever, um, 
put straight. Am I something? Uh, oh, oh, you're right. Sorry, down here. No. Let's just re try refreshing this. Well, there it is. I don't know why it didn't load, but that's okay. But again, if you're using FigWheel, right, you would just change the query, and then the, up, the, the front end would just update. And this is awesome. If you've done UI development, this is it's huge, right? Uh, and, this, and this principle that I'm showing you, right, this would work with React Native, right? You have the sa exact same uh, design principle that works, regardless of what client that you're, that you're targeting. Again, as long as you're using React to do the rendering, because React gets you to iOS and Android. OK. So let's move on. OK, to do. So there are things to do. Uh, query updating is like something that we have to work on. Um, ring pedestal, uh, datomic middleware, is also something we have to do. And there's going to be a ton of work on just bridging. Um, but again, I think this is big. Uh, this is, again, this is exactly what uh, Facebook is talking about, except I'm showing you a demo, and you can just use, you can try the demo today. It just works, uh, especially if you decide to use Atomic. So Atomic actually now is like a, actually an extremely ideal um, a client, sort of client, a thing for clients, right? Datomic is a better database when you're building these dynamic clients. Um, I'm done. But actually, no, I'm not. Um, so this is Euro Closure. And so OMNEX is awesome. I'm really excited about it. But I don't get to talk about ClojureScript very often. And a lot of what I'm talking about OMNEX just fits into a much bigger picture. Uh, so there's actually quite a bit more to do uh, and talk about. Uh, so uh, ClojureScript has, has become really big. And it's very exciting. Uh, you know, I get to talk to a lot of you, and it's very inspiring. Uh, but it's, it's often the case that it's hard to see what is, what is ClojureScript doing? Where is it going? What's the bigger picture? Uh, I actually think with things like OMNEXT uh, and if uh, other frameworks decide to adopt the Relay Falcor ideas, uh, there's a huge opportunity to completely change the way that we think about development. In fact, I think we can leapfrog um, the sort of best practices uh, that are that's sort of like the industry standard. Um, you know, people often say, what's, what's Clojure's killer app? And like, you know, I think the next things I'm going to show uh, it's less like, come on, this is Lisp. Like, like, it's like you have killer apps inside of your killer apps. And uh, some of these demos are going to show that. OK, so why ClojureScript? Uh, and hopefully, the, the OM Next stuff is hope, by itself convincing, but there, there is more. Um, you know, because I think everybody's here because we love Clojure. Clojure's a lot of fun. Uh, Clojure rocks. But JavaScript reaches. Uh, and, and we're seeing that, right? It's, it's on, we're doing nothing, and JavaScript is finding itself more and more. And through ClojureScript, all the places where JavaScript can go, uh, we can go. So there is a big plan. And so let's talk about uh, the big plan, because it's finally becoming uh, kind of clear. So ClojureScript is bigger than the web. I mean, it's the path to all the targets where the JVM can't run, which is a lot. There's a lot of places where the JVM can't run. Um, uh, and there's actually a lot of things that have been set in motion. So if you follow me, you, you see me tweet. But you might not understand you know, what's the big picture for doing all these various things. And let's explain some of these. So we kick-started off a Google Summer of Code project, which is huge. Uh, we've already made a ton of progress. Uh, and it's this project which allows us to process uh, common JS, AMD, and ES2015 modules. And you might be like, well, why do I just want to write ClojureScript. Why do I need that? Um, React is not written in ClojureScript, right? You consume it as this monolithic file. If you want to use React add-ons, you have to consume this even more monolithic file. It's not s susceptible to all the optimizations that you have. Uh, so we're doing work that allows us to process all these different types of module formats, and we convert them into uh, Google Clojure modules. So as far as the Clojure, Clojure script compiler is concerned, it's just all the same type of JavaScript. There's no difference between React um, and your own Clojure script code. This is huge. The other thing we're going to do, and this is, again, we're, this is just the benefit of JavaScript being everywhere, is uh, Java 8 ship NASORN. NASORN is a very great, awesome, high-performance uh, JavaScript library. And you can run JavaScript inside the JVM, and it's fast. Uh, so uh, Babel is huge. It's taking off. Uh, React has switched to Babel. So React doesn't use JSX anymore. It uses Babel to process its, you know, the JSX stuff. Uh, so what we can do inside the ClojureScript compiler now is take React. We can take all the React modules. We can apply Babel to get it back to regular JavaScript. And then we can use our common JS pass to convert it into um, plain old Google Clojure namespaces. So now. React can be dead code eliminated, um, and it can be subjected to things like code motion, which is really big for uh, typical web stuff. 
Um, and it's just, our, it's just our path. And so this, it's bigger than just ClojureScript, right? So there are tools that are getting super popular, and they're all awesome. Things like FigWheel, things like um, uh, boot, boot CLJS, right? The moment that we have this stuff, you can now use Boot CLJS to build your iOS app or your Android app. You can use FigWheel to, to live code um, your Android tablet application, whatever. It, the, the idea is that this actually gives um, other tools uh, superpowers. So huge shout out to Maria Nays. She's the one that's working on this. It's amazing. Um, she's been incredible. Uh, you know, in six months when you're able to be, build iOS or Android stuff uh, and use React Native, uh, you should thank her. Uh, another big thing that's actually a part of this is that once you decide to um, basically reach more clients, how do you compile for these clients? Because the clients, it's not, you know, you have this device. And like, how do you code that device live? The device is here. It's not your laptop. You, you need to test. You don't, wanna, you don't necessarily want to use a simulator. Uh, so this is something I thought about a long time ago. Um, and uh, fortunately, we have a, a really great Objective-C developer in the community, Mike Fikes. Uh, so I worked with him and sort of inspired him, and he really you know, took it to the next level. He wrote a thing called Ambly, um, and it basically takes this amazing application called GCD Web Server, which was designed by uh, an ex-Apple engineer. He actually worked on uh, Quartz Composer, but he left, and he did this thing called GCD Web Server. It's a grand central dispatch-based web server. It includes a fully compliant web dev server built in it, and it has uh, complete support for multicast DNS. Uh, and, and we'll see that here in a second, which means that you can basically use Xcode, install uh, onto your device, and the device is on Wi-Fi, the device will actually, over Wi-Fi, broadcast that it has a REPL. The REPL connects, uh, the device tells um, uh, the, Java, the JVM process, I'm mounting a web dev volume, and the compiler writes to the web dev volume. Uh, and this is just seamless. And so once you've, once you've booted the app, you don't even need Xcode anymore. You just live code against, directly against the device. Uh, so compile sync over web dev, uh, delivers iOS REPL. The connection stuff is really cool. The MDNS stuff is really cool. It's actually, it's, I, I wish we could do this as easily for the browser, but it turns out that um, the GCD web server stuff uh, actually looks, it's quite a bit simpler to set up, which is crazy. Uh, so the thing I'm gonna demo, and sorry, this, again, this is a slow laptop, so this is gonna take a second. Uh, the simulator is not particularly fast to boot. So I'm using Ejecta. Uh, Ejecta is actually, uh, has, has been used by quite a few companies. What is Ejecta? Ejecta is a native WebGL component, it's a WebGL view. And what the developers of Ejecta did is they added, um, it's OpenGL, but they added WebGL bindings and Canvas binding. So you could imagine you want to do visualization, right, on an iOS device, and you want to combine it uh, with React Native. So this would be your arbitrary drawing surface. So this is booted up. Uh, let's switch to uh, this. Um, again, this will take a second. Uh, but Ambly, Ambly is awesome, I, uh, and, and Eject is awesome, right? There's, there's all these things. Again, this is, this is something that was something work that we did not have to do. And what I'm about to demo is exactly the same way that React Native will work, right? You would, you would include um, a tiny little thing inside of your Objective-C thing just to bootstrap. That's all you need this for is just to bootstrap the application. It's like two lines of Objective-C. Uh, and then once you've done that, then you launch Ambly, and Ambly uh, does all the work because, GC, again, the GCD web server thing that you, this little Cocoa Pod thing, it's actually... Uh, quite cool, uh, does, all that, does all the hard stuff for you. You don't, you're not, you don't have to be involved um, in the tricky bits. Uh, again, apologies for this. This is the uh, running a simulator and the, this at the same time is um, pretty intense. Okay, so I'm connected. I'm connected to the simulator. I could have done this over Wi- I mean, I turned Wi-Fi off because the Wi-Fi was messing with my demos, uh, but I could have done this over Wi-Fi if I was developing somewhere else. What I've just done, right, it's, there is a web dev volume that got mounted. The simulator mounted a web dev volume and I just compiled a file into the simulator's documents directory, right? So this would, this would be just the same as if it was on a device. So here I'm, this is connected to JavaScript core. Uh, right? So, and this is better than, this is actually better than um, what React Native can offer. React Native has this crazy thing where you have to reload the entire application. And this is not, this is not what we want for ClojureScript. ClojureScript will have the exact same workflow that you're used to. You're in your source file, you have a REPL, you can hot load code whenever you want. And again, this is not, this is not, this is a, this is not a web view, right? This is a native OpenGL ES view.
Okay. Thanks. Uh, so huge, huge shout out to Mike Fikes. So there's just all these people doing this incredible work, uh, allowing ClojureScript to go places it has never gone before. Um, so then the last thing I'm going to show, which is really cool, and this is super new, which is ClojureScript and ClojureScript, which took a long time uh, to get here, mostly because we really needed reader conditionals to do this correctly. And actually, there was a lot of optimizations in ClojureScript that needed to happen before we could do this uh, in the right way. And ClojureScript and ClojureScript, what's the point of that? That might seem, ah, why, why do we need that? Be I've shown things that don't require this at all. I've shown awesome demos, has nothing to do with um, uh, ClojureScript compiling itself. Now, reach, that's the only reason to do this. It's not for cool points. Uh, it's only because there's cases where, for various reasons, you, you, you just need to strip out the JVM. Um, so, there, so typical things, like Electron's getting very popular. Electron is a fantastic way to build, with JavaScript, um, apps that can run on Linux, Windows, I, uh, and OS X. Um, you, it's awesome. So I mean, Lighttable wanted to do this, but you know, we were, it took a long time to get to where we are. But that's a case where you just want to ship something, and you just want to strip the JVM. Uh, Node.js is a huge case. People have talked about this forever. We're finally uh, close to allowing this. You just want to write a shell script. Node.js starts fast, has a very small memory profile, uh, which is also good for really cool targets like Raspberry Pi, where the JVM is actually uh, pretty slow. Um, a really awesome one, once we get to the point where we have access to native applications on, you know, on Android and iOS, you want to ship updates, right? You don't want to go through the release cycle. So what you can do is you can build your application, you can include the compiler and the analyzer, and then it can just download the ClojureScript file and live update, right? You're able to update the application after the fact without doing uh, deploying another release. Uh, and then there's just a nice one, which is just reaching more people. Um, there's a lot of people that would love to try a REPL or try a library. Uh, and actually, there's going to be support to basically take any library. And you know, there'll be an option in the compiler that says, I want to bootstrap, which means that we'll automatically add the compiler, the analyzer, and the reader. And so now, if you make a really cool library, you can, it's, it'll be like a one-liner to make a REPL so people can try out your library on a website. And you won't have to set up a separate compilation service. So right now, things like Chimera is this really crazy thing. You have to have a separate service to do this. Uh, you won't have to do this anymore. So let's see a little preview. It's not ready, uh, but it's still, it's still totally awesome. Uh, so let's close this. All right. So this, again, is going to take a little while. Uh, so, so what are we looking at here? This is, uh, I mean, I'm not sure how, how familiar you guys are with the ClojureScript compiler, but one of the most complex things in the ClojureScript compiler is actually, actually the macros file. Clojure is completely different, defined in terms of macros. Until you get macros, you really can't do anything. Um, so this is fun. So this is uh, ClojureScript's meta-circular moment. So this is the macros file, cljs.core. This, this defines all the macros, do seek, um, things like you know, plus, which inlines, uh, and so on. So all these things that we're excluding, the reason we have these massive set of exclusions, we have to exclude closures compilers so we can define uh, closure script ones. Uh, but what's quite mind-bending is here we have this thing. When this file is compiled as closure script, it requires itself. Right? It needs to require itself to generate the macros that we generate in JavaScript. So that's pretty crazy. Um, so I'm going to compile the macros file into JavaScript. So this is going to get loaded. So th I, this is a node REPL. So we're compiling it, and it takes a while. It's a huge file, a lot of macros. Uh, we're loading it into um, the Node.js runtime. And let's load uh, the actual demo file now. Uh, so up here, so this, so this will be totally, totally doable. You, you want to build, you want to demo your library, and you just want a single JavaScript file. This is ClojureScript, right? Here I have a, a namespace. This is a ClojureScript file. I'm including tools reader because it got ported. I'm including the analyzer. And this is not a separate analyzer. Right? We're just loading the analyzer that the JVM loads. It's exactly the same analyzer, the same compiler. There's no difference. Uh, let's compile this. And then, uh, so we're going to show this guy. Uh, so here we have, an, so again, not everything works, but this does show something non trivial. It's, this is a, um, it's a function which takes two arguments, it's higher order. We're passing in arguments, fn is a macro, and plus is a macro. So all these things have to work. And again, this, this is just the real ClojureScript compiler. We did not change the ClojureScript compiler to make this work. So let's just clear this out. Let's switch, uh, evaluate this, and there we go. So that's, that's inside of Node.js. I did not, this not happen inside the JVM.
And finally, this is the moment that you've all been waiting for, and that's the string. But eval is trivial, right? You can just pass that uh, to eval. And there's, there you go, three. OK. So uh, the, a huge sh more shout outs. I mean, again, this is, none of this stuff is possible if it wasn't for how awesome the community is. Jonathan Boston and Sean LeBron, they ported uh, Clojure pprint. So this is what makes dealing with the compiler reasonable. We can pretty print the AST. Uh, it made my life much simpler. Niccolo Mameto, he works on Tools Reader. The only reason you have source mapping is because Niccolo Mameto worked on Tools Reader. Uh, we get all the source mapping stuff through Tools Reader. Um, and Andrew McVeigh and others, they ported it to ClojureScript. And it, that's the reason I can demo, also demo this stuff today. It's because we have a reader uh, in ClojureScript. And tons more people. Uh, it's amazing. I, I'm just always super excited. Uh, that I think we have like 109 contributors to ClojureScript that have submitted patches. It's amazing. I expect there will be many more in the future. Uh, that's actually all I had today. Uh, I hope I've been, I'm running out of time. Uh, so the only thing I want to leave you with, uh, it's been great fun. Uh, I'm happy that I got to show this stuff off. Um, and my, my only guidance is, you know, keep calm and take over the world.